today, and this is Converting Old Rails to Community Trails. Uh, again, my name is Sarah Mathers. I'm the first deputy of community engagement in the Mayor Brandon Johnson administration. And um, today, this panel is going to include local trail experts who are excited to discuss, uh, first, the process for repurposing abandoned railroad lines as trails and linear parks, how trail programming and design can help achieve local goals, and how community input is essential for successful development and management. We're doing a little bit of housekeeping up here. We've got some folks, um, we've got somebody who's running late um, and maybe won't be able to join us, but I've got a wonderful panel here for you. Uh, and so I'm gonna introduce them now. Our first panelist is Dr. Brenda G uh, Dixon, uh, the founder of Major Taylor Trail Keepers, a nonprofit dedicated to improving Southside neighborhoods along the Major Taylor. Let's give a, let's give a wave and a, and, a, and a shout out. Wonderful, all right. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Brenda. Um, we also have uh, Ben Hillpand, co-founder of the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail on the Northwest Side. That's in my neighborhood, so I'm happy to see him here, and what a name that is, Ben Helphand, right? That's pretty efficient right there, that works for us. I guess we have some technical difficulties happening, so I'm just gonna keep on vamping over here. Um, and then also, um, we have our moderator that's with us, um, and that's Carolyn O'Boyle um, from the um, Trust for Public Land, where she leads regional and neighborhood projects that improve public access to outdoor green space. Give us a wave, Carolyn. There we go, awesome. Oh my God, look at this entrance that we have. Our third panelist is here. If we had just waited that five minutes, folks, um, come around on this side. All right, so he's getting a grand entrance. Who we have joining us is Anton Seals Jr. <clears throat> Hello, Anton. <laughs> um, he's the executive director of Grow Greater Inglewood and the leading organizer for the long-planned Inglewood Nature Trail. All right, so we got all parts of the city joining us today. We've got our northwest side, we got our south side. Well, I guess we got two south sides, but we are all city, baby, here at City Civics Day. And I'm just gonna keep doing this until Anton joins us. They gotta mic him up, okay, then I'm not gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna, <laughs> um, okay, great. So the panelists, we're gonna thank you for joining us today. Carolyn, please take it away. Thank you so much. I don't know, is my microphone working? Yes, okay. So as our lovely MC mentioned, I'm Carolyn O'Boyle with Trust for Public Land. And we're a national organization <laughs> that works to connect everybody to open and green space where they live. And in urban areas, we're working to do that within 10 minutes of your home. Um, one of the things that city who are working to transform local um, unused infrastructure into neighborhood amenities. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. And I want to say it's great that we have two projects representing the South Side because as Chicagoans well know, two thirds of our city is the South Side. So we need two projects from the South Side. So I'm going to first ask the panelists just to, just to introduce themselves again and then describe the project that they are here representing. Um, where is it? What is it? When it is open? In what stage of completion? Is it? And <coughs> just give us a general lay of the land. So, uh, Brenda, I'm going to ask you to kick okay. it off. All right, great. My mic, can you hear me? Great. All right, hi. I am from Major Taylor Trail Keepers, Chicago. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that was initially founded in 2017 uh, and, and under a different name, it was CNIP, Chicago Neighborhood Improvement Project, and we transferred and became Major Taylor Trail Keepers in 2019. We advocate for the community, uh, the, the Major Taylor Trail, and the greater community at large of all the neighborhoods that border the Major Taylor Trail, which starts at Dan Ryan Woods in the heart, from the heart of the south side, North Inglewood, we got you, but, and it ends at the city limit and borders <coughs> Riverdale crossing over the Little Calumet River. 
we go through, we used to go through five different wards, uh, but with the reorganization, we go through four different wards. And so our concern is we're, we're concerned about the trail, its status. It's marked on the city trail maps as complete. And I'm sure you'll ask me stories, ask me questions as we go through today's panel to talk about why we don't consider it complete. It was complete based on the 1990 standards, but if you were to take our trail and lay it up against the standards of today's trail planning, it is far from complete. Um, did, what else did you tell me to well, talk Brenda, about? Brenda, I wonder if you could just say, what was the origin? Like, where did the impulse <coughs> to create this major Taylor Trail come from? Ah, okay. Well, that was a, it was a, it was actually the first, and this is part of why it's not really complete. It was actually the first uh, Rails to Trails project that the city had undertaken. It started in the, uh, the, the, the 90s. It wasn't actually complete until 2007, but initially it was, it, was, it was the forest preserves. It was the Cook County Forest Preserves. And if you look at any of the Cook County Forest Preserves, it's all rustic. There aren't benches and all of the beautiful amenities that you see in today's urban trails. So that's the origin of it. And that's really the, the basic foundation of why our trail does not have many of the things that we're trying to advocate for. Yeah, question. you did. Thank okay. you. We're going to come back and dig in a little bit. Okay, deeper. great, great. Yep. <coughs> That's good for now. So, Ben, yes. what, what, let us know about the project you're representing, where it is, what it is, and what the origin story <coughs> of it is. So, the Bloomingdale Trail is on the northwest side of Chicago. It runs through four neighborhoods uh, Wicker Park and Bucktown on the, on the east, and Humboldt Park and Logan Square on the west. It's just shy of three miles long. Uh, it's elevated uh, throughout, which is a big difference between, yeah. between our trails. About 18 feet tall, built on, a, on a, a, a former railroad viaduct that served light industry for 100 years. Um, it opened in 2015. We're getting ready for our 10th anniversary coming up. So we're kind of on the other end of, of where some of these other projects are. Uh, so the origins, uh, let's like, Go, doo -doo 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 -doo, go back in time uh, to uh, 2000, 2001. Uh, the freight service had stopped rolling on the Bloomingdale embankment uh, years earlier. There was a clamp on the trail at Kimball Avenue, uh, and nature started to reclaim the space pretty quickly. Uh, trees grew up, uh, prairie had taken over, uh, uh, animals came back. Um, and people in the neighborhood, understandably, started to get curious about what's going on. They had already lived underneath the tracks for decades. They had been painting murals along you know, three miles of canvas uh, that ran through their neighborhoods, but the railroads were separated from them. Uh, once nature took over, they started to venture up there, started to explore, uh, and more and more people did this. Hundreds of people, thousands of people over the years. I ended up being one of these people. I scrambled up there in 2001, right at Whipple Avenue, crawling through a hole in the fence, trespassing, because a lot of projects get started by trespassing. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, and I crawled up just 18 feet, and I, I come out, and it was just magical. It was like song, songbirds singing, like a cartoon, except there actually were birds. It was magical. It was beautiful. I fell in love with it. Um, and then I looked around, and I saw that I wasn't the first person here. There was already a trail through this little forest. Uh, people had pounded with their feet a little trail through this, this prairie, uh, stretching three miles. That was the first proto-Bloomingdale Trail. That's where it all started. It started because people were just boating with their feet. Mm. Um, that little kernel took off in some planning circles. The students at, at UIC, there was a radical biking pedestrian group called Break the Gridlock that did a session on it. Uh, the idea was swirling. Uh, and in 2001, 2002, we formed, six people came together from across those neighborhoods and formed the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail. They were bike advocates, pedestrian advocates like myself. There were folks from Logan Square Neighborhood Association, now Palenque, and Bigger Dyke Redevelopment Corporation, um, who wanted to, they were largely driven by a desire to make the neighborhoods healthier. There were incredibly high rates of juvenile diabetes in Humboldt Park and Logan Square in particular. And this trail was seen as a way to counteract that, to make people's lives healthier. And then, around 2003, the Department of Planning and Development uh, started the planning process for what became the Logan Square Open Space Plan. 
And they heard this idea swirling in the community, like, people want this trail. This trail is already there in some people's minds. Uh, and so it became enshrined in the Logan Square Open Space Plan, adopted by the Plan Commission in 2004. And so really it was the convergence of this community groundswell, uh, this, this desire of people voting with their feet, the birth of the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail, and then the official city plan uh, that all came together uh, to create the platform that would become the Bloomingdale Trail. There's many other steps. Yeah, but, yeah do, do, do. then we fast forward. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much more detail you want me to go into, just but that, that just the quick steps. Yeah. So we kept, you know, a plan is just a plan. Plans are wonderful, but plans can sit on the back burner for decades. I mean, look at the red line extension. Now, thankfully, it's moving. But it takes, it takes community advocates to keep things on the front burner. It takes people making sure it's in the media, making sure aldermen don't forget about it, making sure that people know that people want it. Um, so that's what we focused on for years, the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail. We would do trail cleanups. We would produce swag. I've got posters here that anybody can come and take. Uh, we did posters for years. We did whatever we could to keep this idea alive. We had the, the motto, make the implausible feel inevitable. We wanted this to feel like a done deal. And we did what I recommend everybody does, is we printed a map, uh, this long, skinny map that said, the Bloomingdale Trail is a thing. Here it is. It's on a map. How could you ignore it? So just like present your project as a done deal, and it's really hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. Then in 2000, we were also all volunteers, all volunteers just doing this in the evenings in our kitchens. Um, we knew we needed help. So in 2007, 2008, we reached out to the Trust for Public Land because there was a for sale sign at what is now Julia de Burgos Park uh, at, between Whipple and Albany, right off the Bloomingdale Trail. And we, were, we saw work that they were doing across the neighborhood in, in Haas Park, and we said, we need your help to buy this land. This is going to be an access point to the Bloomingdale Trail. And they said yes. They got involved. Uh, and then over the course of a couple of years, they worked more and more uh, to become the, uh, uh, lead public -private, the, the lead of the public-private partnership that would build the Bloomingdale Trail. Uh, and we broke ground in 2013. Um, I mean, there were a couple of steps along the way, like you know, CDOT applying for federal funding to do the design and engineering. Uh, they had to try a couple of times. Sometimes you have to try a couple of times just because it doesn't work the first time. You keep going. Uh, but we broke ground in 2013 and the trail opened in 2015. And here we are. Here we are. Thank you, Ben. Um, Anton, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would you please give us, a, contextualize us with the Englewood Nature Trail? Where is it? Where we are in the development of it? Et cetera. I hope everybody can. Everybody hear me okay? Cool, because I came in late. Mic up. So, um, again, Anton Seals Jr., lead steward of Grow Greater Inglewood, and the Inglewood Nature Trail, the nexus of it, the beginning, I think all of these projects in Chicago come out of this uh, review during the early 2000s around the Burnham Centennial Plan. So it was a, a real look at all of the kind of unused. Uh, spaces across the city. And so from that, I think the Bloomingdale, uh, what we now call the Inglewood Nature Trail, which was the New Era Trail, and El Paseo, which has an, another name, I think, as well, were three of the different spaces that got a critical look from the city in terms of trying to look at how do you do infrastructure reuse. Uh, and that was before we got Mayor Emanuel, I believe, yes. Um, of course it was. It was before Obama. Um, <laughs> I'm starting to get old here. Um, and so I think what happens from there for us was it is mired in kind of an ongoing kind of um, issue around, you know, the kind of divestment, the st structure, when we talk about structural racism, environmental racism, you know, what's happened in Inglewood and West Inglewood is completely different than I think the other two neighborhoods represented here today. The level of divestment, <laughs> the city owns a majority of the land that's next to the, to the trail, but many of the buildings that sat there over the last, that made up Inglewood, Inglewood and West Inglewood, so it's the greater Inglewood community, you know, had been demolished during the 90s. Um, so you, it, it has the, uh, probably, Inglewood probably and West Garfield Park have some of the highest amount of vacant lots in the city. So you have a, a completely different topography that you have to deal with than, than the 606. So as we, as we start to think about this, and then it's surrounded by two large intermodal uh, yards from two of the nation's largest railroads, uh, Norfolk Southern on the uh, eastern end and CSX on the western end. So the 
trail runs about two miles between Lowe and Damon. Um, and if you don't know much about railroads, they are, you know, much like the government in a way, they kind of really slow and archaic in terms of how they even think about community and community development. Um, and so I think they are kind of like the, the I, I think they're maybe trying to change some of that, but yeah. in, in worst cases, they are like, you know, the bad actors of corporate, they get like the platinum star. It's like, <laughs> I'm not listening to anything the community is saying, I'm moving, I'm just gonna railroad right over you. Yeah. Um, so that had been the, the, the nexus of the land grab on the eastern end of Inglewood, which many people have maybe heard about through the eminent domain process, uh, homes that, so the eastern part of Inglewood just is just uh, where the expressway is, which is another part of the history here because that was the original land grab that broke Inglewood because they dug the 9094 in between communities. So older folks, my family is, I, I'm from South Shore, but my family is from Inglewood, from 56 and Princeton, you know, from, and th this goes back to the early 1930s and 40s before we had an expressway there. And so even how they thought about Inglewood extended beyond what we now think of the, the boundaries. And so from that, uh, there was a push, uh, I think in 2009, around um, doing a, a, a look at the new era uh, plan, Open Lands and a group called Sustainable Inglewood, and several other groups had started thinking about how could this be a, a win for the community as an offset because of the kind of degradation and because of the kind of industrial corridor that once was there. And then nature had also created this uh, tremendous space just above what um, was Dean Chirac. Actually, Chirac was shot on the trail. So that's where a lot of the scenes in Chirac are right underneath the trellises of the trail, um, which we hate that name anyway because it was a misnomer. <coughs> um, but nonetheless, I think that becomes the impetus of the Inglewood Trail. And it had appeared in the quality of life plan that we had been doing um, across the neighborhood. It appeared in the Green Healthy Neighborhoods plan. And it was this intersection for us around urban ag of taking vacant lots, which we're still doing, and converting them into farms, and supporting farmers who are being trained at Windy City Harvest or Urban Growers Collective to access land, which is a whole other component of this that you know, accessing and redeveloping land from a community standpoint takes a lot of steps, a lot of learning, a lot of listening, a lot of advocacy, a lot of you know, stepping on a lot of people's toes because the structure of Chicago is like, well, I know, and usually that class of folks is usually a racial component to that, who's you know, been in control, who knows how to do certain things, that kind of browbeating of who should be able to do it. Well, if the folks who only know, they will always continue to do these projects if we don't share and open that up. So part of our push was not just the project, but the process of how the city would go about doing these kind of uh, uh, projects, and also the ongoing kind of not um, allowing for forces to kind of, you know, sequester you to a corner of just the community voice. That the design, the, the element of the space was critically important because we're not just there just for the, you know, of course, a beautiful space, but the beautiful space is much deeper than that in terms of that we need jobs, we need economic development, and we saw the trail as an opportunity to kind of push those things forward. And so um, in 2017, we did a new a concept plan. We refreshed it. So part of what Ben talked about, continuously advocating, um, raising money to advocate, to say this is a great catalytic, you know, and it, even when it's not on the city's uh, front burner, you know, sometimes the role of advocates is to say this has to be part of the ongoing conversation. We need, you know, larger plans. This can't just get swallowed up. And a lot of that was advocacy from a group of stakeholders that we have been gathering over the years to say this is something that, and often these plans already exist, is that who becomes the actionaries to do them? Mm -hmm. And what had shifted with our project is that instead of groups coming in, consultants, other <clears throat> folks who come in and say, oh, I can do this, but that's where the money is being made. I'm gonna dig into this in mm -hmm. a minute. Yep. Um, <coughs> but but I want to just back up a minute and, and ask, I mean, maybe I'll just reverse the order, and ask Anton to start by saying, what is the value of a project like this in Englewood, and what are the potential pitfalls of a project like this? Um, well, the big value is, you know, improving the overall health of the community. 
um, which is you know, a public health crisis from public <coughs> violence that has plagued Inglewood to the lack of kind of poverty that has plagued Inglewood, um, and also the kind of air quality and environmental degradation that's happened in Inglewood. And so I think that you know, all three of these things are important drivers of how this can be another part of, and Inglewood is quite big. It's from 55th to 75th, from state to Dane. So land-wise, Inglewood and West Inglewood are huge. But it is also one of the communities that we, in Chicago over the last 30 years has lost a tremendous amount of its population, a tremendous amount. Um, so I think th those are the big drivers for us um, that add value that, you know, one is improving this, the, the soil and the, and the community. So taking an approach around healing the earth and the people within it, um, the protections that we need for our community. So the, what I would say pitfalls or opportunities is that often these infrastructure reuse projects are based on, you know, an improvement, but that collective imagination of improvement uh, is tied to gentrification and a market right, for improved value. But one of the things that we're trying to untether is, is that, you know, if we don't as a society figure out that parks and, you know, nice spaces are not just amenities, they're necessities, and they can't drive up and, you know, just be seen as an amenity that then, you know, attracts developers, right, that then assign value to these spaces, that is, in fact, what spurs gentrification. And it's not something I think that we're overly concerned about in this way because I think it's sometimes overhyped because there is a several layers that require, we still have a lot of vacancies, we still have, you know, so there's a housing strategy that still needs to happen. So it's not just this trail. Um, and so part of that, what I would just end by saying is that that's why with uh, DPD and other partners in the sit in our community is like, we're looking at this as an agro eco district of bringing both this kind of work that we've been doing around urban ag um, to open it up to also these elements of sustainability. And then how do you attract, you know, these kind of new businesses to be in and then grow the businesses that are there? There are folks who are in these spaces or who are being educated, who are going away to school. How do we attract them back? So part of that is the ongoing planning to say on 59th Street corridor, it is a really great opportunity to have both this kind of economic drive and then also this kind of natural uh, nature space in an urban space is really important. Great. Thanks, Anton. Ben, same question to you. So the value of the Bloomingdale Trail, <coughs> I think two big things jump out. Uh, like one, my helmet's right over there because I hopped on a, a divvy and biked the trail to get here today. Uh, so just the transportation function is huge. Uh, Tens of thousands of people use the Bloomingdale Trail to get to work, to get to school, uh, to get around the neighborhood. Uh, we just passed 10 million users of the trail. It's about 1.2 million people a year because we have trail counters on there. Um, so, you know, if you dig into the funding that I was referring to earlier that uh, CDOT applied for was federal transportation dollars to support alternative transportation. Uh, Bloomingdale Trail is fulfilling that function. That was one of the the major funders of the entire trail, I think $50 million of it. So um, <laughs> the, second, the second thing is, uh, I think, health, going back to that initial driver. Um, there's people who are using it for community, but a lot of people don't, they're not getting on there in their spandex and going end to end. Uh, they're going up there and they're taking their evening stroll or their Sunday stroll with their family. Uh, people are walking more and living healthier lives because of, because of the trail. Um, potential pitfalls, I think there's, there's one that's a little, bit, a little bit subtle, but like these, as these trails emerge, they can be kind of sexy projects. People look longingly to the High Line and they think they're gonna plop the High Line in, in a neighborhood, which we're not. That's a unique project. Every trail has its own unique context. Um, but you can kind of get stars in your eyes and with the Bloomingdale Trail, things kind of snowballed. They happened really, really quick, especially uh, in the Emanuel administration. Uh, and what had been a more community-driven project with, with commitments in the Daly administration that they would build the capacity of the community organization, the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail, kind of like Grow Greater Englewood, 
Um, so that on the other end, there would be this robust community group that is helping to steward, steward the space. That got, kind of got left by the wayside in 2012, 2011, as the project picked up speed, and there was so much pressure to build it really quickly. Um, and there were, there were thoughts, you know, there were plans written up of let's have a $5 million annual conservancy to run this space. Um, none of that ever happened. Uh, but people were imagining these possibilities. Um, and, you know, even though there was a huge, robust community process for the design, the community, uh, um, community control of the project fizzled. Um, and I think that was a real missed opportunity. You know, they could have been spending, we could have been spending years building up that capacity. And frankly, we're only catching up now, now that kind of reality has settled in. Uh, but we're like five years behind, seven years behind, unfortunately. Um, and I think an offshoot of that, you know, the cherry on the top of that was the name uh, reshuffling. Some people, you, know, you use Bloomingdale Trail and 606. A lot of people use them interchangeably. I'm wearing my Bloomingdale Trail swag. Um, in 20, 2013, um, the, the name that had been the communities for a decade, the Bloomingdale Trail, was recast under this umbrella of the, the 606 as a as kind of a branding exercise. Let's call it this, uh, we'll raise more money, uh, but oh, the community names will all remain the same underneath, the Bloomingdale Trail, Walsh Park, Julia de Burgos Park, Churchill Field. Um, that was the promise, but it never, it never happened. And the Bloomingdale Trail was not named the Bloomingdale Trail after it opened in 2015. It was kind of this sleight of hand, like, oh, here is the 606 now, which isn't a terrible name, but it's not the name that was the community's or promise. Um, and it took us five years advocating with the community and aldermen to get the park district to actually officially name it Bloomingdale Trail. So I encourage you all to call it Bloomingdale Trail under the umbrella of the 606. So uh, it is what it is. Um, I mention that mostly because it, it's kind of uh, uh, emblematic of that process that I was talking about where this community control, and community leadership is... It's siphoned away, like Anton was talking about, happens sometimes. Yeah. And that's really an older model of park building and trail building. The new model is like, this will be run by Grow Greater Englewood in partnership with the city and, and other players. And that's, where um, we're gonna, that's yeah. how we're going to yeah. end. So let's yeah. hold that thought about the, the sort of ongoing stewardship. And yeah. Brenda, let's hear about your, uh, your take sure. on this question. I will answer the question, but I have to comment. What I would love to see is that all of the Chicago land trails are called, referred to as an umbrella of the 606 trails, a community of trails. But anyway, just comment based on, because we're all in the, all of us are in 606. All right, but to your True, question. That's what a lot of people yeah. think, because all the trails are yeah, under this umbrella, yeah, which yeah, is we should confusing. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, as far as uh, benefits, I think the, the, the short elevator answer to benefits would be our, our, our organization's vision and mission statement is, we want to see our, not just our trail, but our community be a fun, healthy, safe place yeah. to live, work, and play as far as benefits. So, and I have to take you back down memory lane. Um, <laughs> yeah, back down memory lane. Um, so, the, and it also touches on the origins of the trail. So, I, this, I grew up in this community. About My family home is about four blocks from the trail, and I remember when the train the, tra the tracks were active, and then I remember when they were abandoned, okay? I also remember when we had grocery stores everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but we had more than what we have. Um, so the, the trail, actually, it's, it's, it's a pathway for several things. Our, the community, the south end of the community is in a food desert. And now, instead of people trucking across old, dilapidated, abandoned trail, uh, tr train tracks, because by the time I was in my teen years, they were horrible. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't even pass over them without risking, was your muffler going to be torn up? Or, you know, they were just not taken care of. And they also was, was not a safe place to walk uh, because they weren't taken care of. So now that it, it is at least, it's paved. If you sit out there on any of our cleanup days for any extended period of time, you actually will see people on the south end with grocery carts and shopping bags going to the closest partial grocery store, because Aldi's is not a full service grocery store, that it's used as a, as a pathway. So that's, a, I mean, there's just a myriad of benefits. You also will see people out jogging, running, biking. We didn't have, we didn't see that when I was, when I was a little girl and it was just abandoned trail tracks. 
So it is already, even with it not being in its complete stage the way we'd like to see it, it is already a pathway getting us closer to our communities being a fun, self, fun, safe, healthy place to live, work, and play. Now, challenges, as opposed to pit challenges, one of the biggest challenges, and if I were to give it in my 30-second elevator speeches, you have to think about the origins of our trail. When it was the train tracks, did, you want to, did anyone want their home or their business facing the train tracks? Absolutely not. Everyone wanted to turn their backs to the train. No, but nobody wants to see that. And so now that it is a trail, our biggest challenge is trying to just change everyone's mindset, business, industry, everyone, that we want to now face the trail. This is something beautiful in our community. Well, it can be something beautiful once we get it, mm -hmm. you know, get it up to par. So I would say our, our biggest challenge um, to, get, to, to not talk for 20 minutes is trying to get people to now, let's face the trail, let's embrace the trail. This trail, because it literally, it cuts through four different wards, a myriad of different communities and different income levels. The south end of the trail is probably very similar to Inglewood. We have some poverty there. Uh, if you go in the Beverly area, you have, you have some wealth there. So it's also <laughs> another benefit. It, it's pulling, it, it has the ability to pull communities together. Um, so, and I want to, I don't want to, because I can yeah. talk for a long time. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let but, you talk some more, but first, okay. we're going to have a brief commercial um, from Professor Seals. Professor? <laughs> oh, he got up I, I just, I just uh, promoted him. Yeah. It's going to give us a two minute, you don't know what you're doing, but you, 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 you will remember a two minute recap of how budgets work in the city oh, of yeah. Chicago. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> We, can we talked team, about it, remember? So city budget <laughs> yeah. versus, um, you know, park district budget versus, you know, you, this coming minute. Yeah, two so, minutes. Okay, two minutes. Okay. Uh, I think there's a few things that I would just say. One is that I think oftentimes people think of the city of Chicago and the sister agencies as one big thing, and they're not. They each have separate budgets. Um, the advocacy of understanding what the budget process is and how do you work with your aldermen to kind of, you know, what I see a lot of is often on the other end is like when an alderman makes a decision or is not informed that the community reacts as opposed to being the advocate, especially in our communities where these kind of projects are sometimes pitted as an either or. You have to get jobs or this. And it's, that's one, not fair. And two, it's like it's not a reparational framework that we're working through. So when you start talking about budgets, you have to look at these are choices that the city is making. And so thinking about how the city, you can advocate and have the city apply for federal funding, in particular right now, this small window of time that whatever people's politics are, uh, there is tons of money coming out of Washington, D.C. in this time. So often I'm concerned that people are so glamored here and not paying attention that the state and the city are going after billions of dollars specifically for communities like ours to have some level of rebound. And what ends up happening is an articulation in terms of who's in those rooms around budgets don't look like the folks that are in these communities and don't articulate it with force around like, well, no, you can't have that. Right. Equity is not about you getting extra scoops when you have 12 <clears throat> scoops on the, like, I have no buildings here, yeah. right? And so for some, it's like, will this all be equal? Well, no, we're not all equal. Right, or we wouldn't have inequity, right? right? And that's sometimes, so that budget question is really the numbers of the thinking of that. And, you know, and so I think it's the, the pragmatic piece of also understanding state budgets, how that is allocated. And I, I just have to say, you know, because parks and recreation and environment are in super white spaces, right? But they all are articulating around the the impacts from all the data is like all the black and brown folks are the ones who suffer the most, right? So the efforts that I've seen underway is to get more of those folks in the conversation and leading and building the tables because then it's like, okay, then we have a community, right? Then we have the kind of stretching of ideas and it's not just all just dedicated towards a certain belief. And that's how budgets, you know, play out because those are the decisions of the dollars, how they're allocated. And I will just add that Chicago is actually unique in that our parks budget is separate from our city budget. Correct. So um, there's a whole, if you notice on your property taxes, there's a special line just for park districts like there is for schools. 
So that's different from most major and cities. And it's also understanding the county, yeah. the state, yeah. mm -hmm. and the city, and how that is then relegated to parks, but then also understanding the city space around open space, which yeah. is different than parks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the next question, and then you can okay. fold your response into that. <laughs> okay. Because really, the, the final question that I want to pose to our panelists has to do with the balance between um, the role of the government and the local community um, advocates in generating, building, designing, planning, stewarding, maintaining these, what end up being very complicated public projects. So um, Brenda, I'm gonna sure. toss it to you first. Great, well, um, and I'm gonna start by finishing part of the initial answer. One of our greatest challenges is something that Anton just spoke on. What's one of the things that's unique about the Major Taylor Trail is it's not just one jurisdiction. If, oh, it, right. if we were all owned by the Chicago Park <coughs> District, hallelujah, it would be so easy. We have at least four to five different government entities that have the ownership and control of the entire trail, because the entire trail is about 8.6 miles. The, the beginning and the end is owned by Cook County Forest Preserves. Then you have your sections, park sections in the middle that is Chicago Park District, and some of that land was just recently transferred over to them after the trail was initially built, which is part of why it's not at the same standard that the Bloomingdale Trail is. And then there's this other mile and a half portion that is CDOT. So mm -hmm. when we have to, av I mean, av advocating is just a, it's a constant, huge undertaking. When someone reaches out to our, we have an email, contact us at majortaylortrailkeepers.org. When they, when they send us uh, an email telling us or call us and tell us something is happening at a certain location, all of us have to first go and figure out, well, which jurisdiction does this actually belong to? So um, I just, it, it, and coupled with, one of the other unique things of our trail is we have, uh, we do have businesses adjacent to our trail that are very profitable. ComEd, power lines, go, uh, they own all, almost all of the land that is immediately adjacent to our trail with the power lines, millions of dollars made over the decades. You know, it, we have the National Processing Center, there's the Amtrak, there's a National, uh, People's Gas. We have several uh, businesses that border our trail that those, but those businesses are not investing into the trail or, it, or investing into the community to our knowledge. And then can you remind me of the question well, again so I can answer the, the question? The, I'm sorry. Where, where does the, the role between the government and the local community groups, well, where's that line? What is ideal? Ideal, I think, I think we are at a point now, when I first started this 10 years ago, it was an adversarial relationship between us, we, we were the, at that point, we were the friends of the Major Taylor Trail and the parks, Chicago Park District. We were adversaries with the Cook County Forest Reserve because we were like, what, you guys aren't, you're, you're not even mowing the lawn. Uh, can you come and do something? But I will say that over the, I would say at least the last five, maybe six years, it, it, is, a, it, it is a beautiful relationship. Literally, we just, I'll give you one vignette. We just had a, a, a resident reach out to us to tell us that the lights had gone out from 111th all the way up to 105th. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. This is going to be months waiting to get those fixed. We eat, because we've developed this, one, this relationship with the uh, park district staff, I kid you not, it was less than 48 hours the lights were repaired. Um, the, the landscape, well, we don't really have any formal landscaping. We work, we would like to get that, but the lawn is mowed. You see people on a regular basis out there, they're mowing the lawns, they're, they're <coughs> taking care of it as best as, as best as you would expect. And, and I have to give, uh, I just have to give a shout out and kudos to both the Cook County Forest Reserve as well as the Chicago Park District. The other improvement that we've seen is we've been, we, we've been heard. Um, between 95th and 105th, you, t you could get lost because that's the CDOT component and you, you don't even realize that it's all one trail. And I, I think that's just been in the last two or three years that I, we have seen where the CDOT is going out and they're putting the share rows. It doesn't say Major Taylor Trail, but we can, we, at least we know it's, it's part of a trail. So it's been, it's been a work in progress. And we, we as residents, I would have to say we had a shift. Um, we, we had a shift in our approach 
Um, and we, we, what we started doing, we, whenever we saw something great happening, we figured out, well, which department was this? And we would start sending that department the, comp, the thank yous and the, the written thank yous, saying thank you for this. Uh, it goes back, I don't want to quote scriptures, but you know, you, you, you I, I'm not, okay, let me stop. Oh. But we changed our, we, we partially yeah. changed our approach also. We give, we give kudos when they do things that are well, and so now we just want them to build out. We want, we don't have park benches to sit on, except for at 111th, and that's a kudos to the park district also. That's the only space where we have benches. We don't have water fountains. Or like, it yeah. was just built as a rustic mm -hmm. trail, and it's just the pavement, and it was, that's it. It was built as a rustic trail with yeah. hardly any community input up Correct. front. Zero. Ben. Yeah, you catch more flies with honey. Yes. This is the lesson. Yes. <laughs> and the other, the other lesson is, like, uh, uh, cities are made up of people. I mean, city government is made up of people. Real people with real feelings. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they like to be told thank you sometimes, because they're, for the most part, like, working hard with a big stack of projects. Uh, so, like, that is a really yeah. good method. I want to just, one thing to acknowledge is there's, there's an inequality in terms of the amount of organizing that's possible sometimes. Uh, I think there's a reality that wealthier neighborhoods tend to have more leisure time and uh, 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 other neighborhoods do, do not. So I think, I think we, we recognize that uh, some neighborhoods have an abundance of ability and resources to organize for things like the Bloomingdale Trail. Uh, and other neighborhoods have struggled for that. I mean, if you look at, there's one of the trails that we haven't mentioned is the, uh, uh, the Lawndale in, Embankment, which is a proposed trail, but it does not have a friends group like this championing it yet. Uh, it should. Um, so I think that's just a, a reality. So I think the, the line, to get back to your question, is like the line of where community leaves off and government or governments uh, uh, steps in is shifting a little bit. I think the older model was uh, the community group would champion something uh, and then we'd kind of hand it off. Uh, and that was our role. Um, and oftentimes there was a, you know, a middleman, uh, a, a nonprofit like the Trust for Public Land that would step in and, and help do like some big lifting in the middle there. But that was the, that was the agreement. Um, and I think over the last 15 years that line has started to shift where the, the community wants to not just hand it off, not just be a cheerleader, but be involved yeah. through not just design, through construction, um, and then after construction, what is, we have to ask him this question, which I think Grover Englewood mm -hmm. is asking, which is what is the permanent ongoing role of community yeah. Yeah. in the maintenance and stewardship of these spaces? And this is something we haven't figured out as, at a city, and lots of cities are struggling with it, uh, where we've been talking for years that there needs to be a community conservation corps, which I think you are building. Um, can we just but, let yeah. can we just move it over to Let's Anton it. then because like I mean well I would just say that is the, the you know it is it's taking I would say organize organize and organize yeah so part of the the the, the slow walking of it has allowed us to organize more voices more community around why this is not just a park right this was about health this is about jobs mm -hmm. this is about mm -hmm. mobility this is about value in your home this is about all the things you know, that people have been talking about. I think then the practice of that, you know, in terms of government and who has, so the assembly of government sometimes is intimidating, but one is, you know, this becomes, a, became, and it's still an ongoing opportunity for us to get people to understand how budgets are done, to track the research, what's happening, what's getting passed, right? The people who are most vulnerable to understand that process, right? To ask, not, not just to show up, sometimes you do have to show up with a hammer, but oftentimes you need to show up with a, a scraper, right? So that's how I look at it. Like we have a toolkit, we can come in like, what, we talking about reparations and we talking about real repair? Well, we clearly see there's a mismatch in the city. Clearly, if you were from Chicago, there are separate, these are separate cities. If you do not see that, you are blind, Yeah. right? Amen. So part of the co-governance is going in there with a level of authority as community, as a voice, right? But not just to be adversarial. Right. Because to Ben's point, what we've learned over the, these last several years, it did start adversarial yeah. in an adversarial tone because it's like, we need, why are we always getting the short end of the right. stick? Right. Right. 
Why do we have to have just the bare minimum because we're in the black and there's so many other things? Well, all of these things were intentional and there are still people in the middle, right, who are buying land for cheap, who are mm -hmm. sitting in there. There's tons of money floating in the state that's never used well, right, that people have access to, right? So part of that is learning all of these systems and then not just, it's not just about one organization, it's also about a network of organizations. Yeah. And stakeholders, and then helping the city, um, and because it, it, there is then your partners. Mm -hmm. It's not just about you coming in saying the city does X. What you'll find is this is an opportunity to get the next generation. Like we want these. This is our city. You're paying tax dollars, and the people who work there are your neighbors. Yeah. So sometimes that gets lost in this in the sauce because you get so focused, and it's like I want you to do X. It's like doing a community benefits agreement. That's great, but then who implements it? How do they understand that work? How do you play a role once it's done? And that is where we have to move towards is like, not just stirring up the pot and then saying, okay, I got that, that part done. It's like, well, who's actually implementing and executing? Who has that power and control? And I think that's where um, that shared co-governance uh, is a tremendous opportunity in Chicago. And we'll leave it there on that excellent summation. <laughs> Um, and open it up for any questions that the audience might have. There's some microphones roaming. Any questions, comments? Gentleman in the orange shirt. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you explain um, why your trail was, was, was named 606, other than zip code, why, why 606? That's a question for Ben. Why was the trail named the 606? There was a, a pro bono uh, naming entity called Landor in 2013 that was brought in by the Trust for Public Land to do a naming exercise. Uh, and they came up with a bunch of different names. They were just looking at the name uh, and they s settled on the 606 as this umbrella brand that would include the Bloomingdale Trail as the backbone of this project. And then all of the access parks, there's six access parks uh, along the Bloomingdale Trail. Um, but it never went through like the park district naming process or any of that. It was just kind of brought in, in my view, some kind of as a brand, as a new brand. And the idea was that it would help raise money, but it didn't, it wasn't particularly successful in raising money, but a lot of money was spent on it. And now we have it as a brand, even though the the actual name of the, of the parks that make up the 606 are different. So that was the origin of it. I think it was a, like a branding exercise. Yeah, but it was named for the, the zip code which most Chicagoans share. All right, so there's yeah. some questions over here, I see. I have a question about how do you find information as someone who has gone specifically looking in mind with getting involved. It's very difficult to find where to even start. And online, I'm sure there's information, but it's very overwhelming on where you can even start to join and give back to the community. Where, where is, like, when are the meetings happening? Where is all this information? Is it posted in one spot? Like, is there any, like, you guys talked about a community core. Is there, like, a centralized group working on disseminating information? And, culminating it all in one area so people aren't searching forever <laughs> trying to find it. It's the, the acoustics make it a little hard to hear your question, but I think what you're asking is how do you get involved, how do you find where the efforts are, how do you know where to plug in? Is that right? Essentially. Okay. So, panelists? Well, you, you, for, uh, for the Major Taylor Trail, you can go to majortaylortrailkeepers.org and um, you can reach out to us through, via the website. Um, our our email address yeah. is contact us at majortaylortrailkeepers.org. Um, you can send us an email, let us know. Uh, there's a myriad of ways you can participate and, and get involved. We have board meetings typically at least three times a year. Um, you're always welcome to come. But we have two cleanup days. We have one at Earth, uh, one cleanup day on Earth Day, which is citywide. And then we usually have another one about a week or two before our annual uh, uh, engagement yeah. event. Um, this year our event will be September 7th, it's, um, it's a Saturday, and it's a celebration of the trail. Um, it, ser it, it serves a dual role, it's to get our community engaged and activated, 
Uh, it also serves as a fundraiser. However, because of our vision and mission, we have discount codes for every ward that if someone cannot afford to pay the $35, there's a discount code where you can register and come for free to participate. So I think that's, that's yeah. specifically for Major Taylor. Ben, Correct. do you have a thought about generally? Yeah, I mean, I think generally, uh, if you're looking to get plugged in, often it's really good to look at your, your neighborhood's like, leading community organizations like Garfield Community Council. Um, or Palenque, LSNA, uh, or, you know, and most parts of the city have big organizations like this. Jump in, get involved. They're often the ones who are engaged with a lot of these projects. But the other thing I would say is, uh, like, you are the plug. Like, oftentimes, there's nothing to plug into because you've got you to gotta, you gotta be the socket. Uh, <laughs> you've got to, like, I think a lot of us, when we started organizing, there was no organization. Yeah, there wasn't. We were just, like, looking around, and we're like, this could be here. And we started, yeah. like, we would just be that broken record talking about it at get-togethers. Like, hey, have you guys, I mean, if I could go back and talk to myself in, in 2002, I would have been that guy with less gray in my beard at parties being like, hey, have you guys checked out this, this Bloomingdale embankment? And you're like, yeah, I've trespassed up there. And, like, that's how it started. And we found six yeah. other people yeah. who had the same idea, and we formed the group. So, like... Put your crazy ideas out there yeah. and start talking to people and form together. Put your crazy ideas out there. I think that's a great that's way yeah. to end this panel. <laughs>